Hey everyone, Curse Deck Builder here, making our way to 10,000 decks assisted. And here we have our second, second draft of a deck with Xenagos, God of Revels. This deck has been sent to us by Eric, who has graciously supported the channel to bring their deck to the front of the queue. Thank you so much, Eric. I really appreciate it. They say that this is their second pass at this deck. They submitted it to me about three months ago, and they've had some time to test out my suggestions and some improvements of their own, and they are happy with the results. They're curious if there were any other things they think I could, uh, that I think could fit in, and if there's any more cards that I am still not enamored with. Either way, they appreciate the help. And in terms of restrictions, they say that there are no restrictions, but they're trying to keep it at a medium-high power level, so no fast mana aside from the obvious exception, which I have to assume is Soul Ring. Once again, thank you, Eric, and we'll see what we can do to improve this deck. If you would like to send me your own deck list so I can make a video of it, there is a link to a form in the video description below that you can fill out and send my way, and from that, I can try to improve your deck. And if you, like Eric, would like your video to be the next one I make, there is a link where you can support the channel and move through the queue. Finally, as always, the deck list that we're going to look at is in the video description below. Whether you want to take a look yourself or build it, this is a perfect, perfect way to take, I guess, a look and build it. <laughs> All right. Though this is the second draft, let's go over what Xenagos does again before we get into the deck, the deck list. Xenagos God of Revels is a 5-mana gruel that's red and green, 6-5 indestructible Theros God. The Theros gods are not creatures unless devotion uh, to red and this one specifically is red and green is less than seven, which is almost beneficial because generally you don't want these to be creatures because they're harder to deal with. But the main reason we are playing Xenagos is for the ability of, at the beginning of combat on your turn, another target creature you control gains haste, gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is that creature's power. This is basically berserk but without a sacrifice clause at the end. This is a very, very powerful ability because it allows your creatures to grow really quickly. It gives them haste. And with that in mind, you can start smashing face incredibly quickly. I really like this. And obviously the indestructibility is super, super relevant, especially if you can keep Xenagos from being a creature. It just helps keep your commander on board. Looking at the deck list proper, this deck is really in a nice place. There's a few things that I don't love, but otherwise the deck is functional. As always with second drafts, we're gonna be try we're gonna try to be a little more critical on a few of the choices that stick out, because at this point the deck itself has a really nice kind of uh, skeleton to it, let's say. And so what we need to do is just edit a few little things and maybe talk about lands <laughs> and then otherwise we'll be in a good position. Um, I am, this is the second second draft of the day and I'm always just a little <laughs> nervous when I'm doing these because I'm like, my long-term or medium-term memory is not ideal. I look at so many magic cards all the time and I hope I'm not suggesting something that I previously said take out. But if I am, I mean, take it with a grain of salt, I'll say. We all make mistakes, but also as the meta around me and the meta in Commander moves, we always have to remember that certain cards come and go in vogue and some will be better at certain times than others. So looking at this deck, uh, our meta curve is something that I kind of is kind of on my mind, mainly the three drop area. We can see when we're looking at this graph that the three drops are by far the most amount of cards that we have. What does it say here? It says total 18. I wish it just said 18. Um, so there's 18 three mana spells. And one of the things with the highest number of cards on our curve that's worth remembering is that you have to start factoring in if you have two of them you want to cast in the in a turn. Hence why usually I like the highest one to be at one or two mana. Usually two is where it ends up because you can cast two two mana spells on your fourth turn or with your fourth mana, let's say. Whereas to cast two three mana spells, well, that's a bit trickier because at that point you need six mana and that can be kind of 
that's a lot rougher. And so if we take this and we kind of add on to the six mana drop, we can see that would be kind of a problem. We're also very low on four drops. And I feel, I think I did find a few four drops that I wanted to put in. Uh, I did probably also find a few three drops because that's how I always am. <laughs> but uh, let's, let's, let's see what our three drops are and if there's any we can take out. Now, a bunch of these three drops aren't actually three drops per se. Kalini Ambush, Ka Kalini, yeah, is actually uh, land. So is Kazul's Fury, is Kazul's Cliffs, uh, Balaged Recovery as well. So those already a little better. Then, if we look at Deflecting Swat, that's also actually a free spell, so we can remove it from that list as well. So our goals are to find the cards that stick out that are weaker than the others. Now, or alternatively, looking over here at Aggravated Assault, we can actually change this into the four mana sorcery version of this card. Is Aggravated Assault better because you can just keep tapping it if you have enough mana? Yeah, but is there a lot of situations you're willing to pay eight mana for that first uh, extra combat, which is what you're doing, and I don't know if that's worth it. And in terms of trying to spread out the mana curve, I think I would just like it at the four mana card. Another two cards that I find are interesting is Gwenna, Eyes of Gaia, and let's see, Somber Walled Sage. Now, both of these cards are kind of like classic, Somber Walled Sage being a bit stronger, classic kind of creature decks ramp packages. And this is kind of my opinion, but I mean, that's what you're here for, so I'll say it anyways. I don't like these cards. And I don't like these cards because they're slow and they don't really do anything, right? They don't provide advantage, they provide speed. If your opponent has removal, it is very, very... It doesn't really change if you play your, you know... Your, your big drop on turn five or on turn six or on turn seven, right? Uh, you're, if they have the removal ready, they're going, to, they're going to remove it. Let's say Swords to Plowshares, you're going to lose that creature. Now the big benefit is, right, that Somberwald Sage allows you to play it earlier, which is generally good, but at the same time, once you get to the point that you're trying to play around your opponents with your big creatures, it's not so much how fast can you play them, it's more about it's more about the timing in general, right? When your opponents are all, like, when your control opponent is tapped out, you don't want to be dropping, like, Pathbreaker Ibix, right? You want to maybe take a slower turn, play that nature's lore that's been in your hand, put out a mana dork, maybe hold up some... Uh, removal and just go for a regular attack, right? You don't want to go all in on your like winning winnings card when you're so susceptible to the counter spells they might have. Now, don't get me wrong; you should sometimes just force them to have it. I'm just suggesting in certain situations, it is not the idea is not to get this card out as fast as possible. It is to get this card out at the right time. So with that in mind, I don't find these speed boosts really, really that important. If you want to get cards out early, it's usually like Ristic Study or Smothering Tide. You know, cards that provide like large advantage either immediately, like Necropotence, or like uh, Ristic Study that just gets better and better the longer it's on the field. Harder to remove, and even if they try to remove it, most likely you're going to gain advantage from it where Ensemble Wild Sage is just putting creatures out. The other thing, for what it's worth, she is at one life that does, one toughness is very, very vulnerable. No matter what power level you're at, you are very, very vulnerable to removal, especially incidental removal. Someone's playing Hapatra, someone's playing a red ping deck, like Tim's or what have you with the Prodigal uh, Pyromancer. Someone's playing, you know, Ram Through or I don't know, a number of cards, right? Uh, anyone has equipment that has like a, like a bow effect where it deals one damage? Somberwald Sage is a really, really easy target because uh, she might have summoning sickness, which means they can ping her down before you gain any of the mana. She might, you know, 
she might be just incidental damage to an effect that is just selectively destroying creatures. But either way, you know, especially on repeatable effects, like a mayhem devil and someone sacrifices a treasure, I would definitely tar target this creature because the value, you're basically burning three mana of your opponent, is just really, really high. And, I mean, all of this is to say, I don't love the cards. Now, Gwena Eyes of Gaia does grow, but on the other side, they only provide two mana, and at least you could use that for activated abilities, but still, it's not ideal. And even if you grow them, let's say you, you cast two five mana creature spells, right? All of a sudden, Gwena is a four five. Are you gonna attack with them? Uh, probably not. I do appreciate that Xenagos can make, that, uh, make them into like an eight nine, which isn't bad at all, but at the same time, you probably have better Xenagos targets and you probably want to keep Gwena for the mana, right? So I don't know to what degree... <sighs> you know what? It's also the fact that Gwena, in order for, uh, for them to grow into like a 4-5, you have to be dropping big creatures, and if you're dropping big creatures, you're doing well, right? If there's a board clear or something, Gwena's gone anyways. If they've been removing all of your creatures, okay, I guess you get the Gwena being a 4-5, but most of the time you're already ahead, so why do you need Gwena to grow? I don't know. I've talked too long about these two cards. All that to say, I don't particularly like them. I feel they're kind of weaker. Now, don't get me wrong, I recognize that they can make a slump because they get to jump you from 3 to 5 mana, and when you have 30, quote-unquote, 35 lands, um, it is important to have that. But I want to add lands, and I think I would like to cut these to relieve some pressure off the 3 mana section, and I think these cards are just not as good as everything else. Uh, Cultivate and Kodama's Reach, I guess because you're trying to hit five mana, I do like them here. I wonder to what degree you'd, like, would you be amenable to be playing the four mana versions of these cards? I'm talking about cards that, uh, let's see what we can find, like Batter, Battle of Zendikar or Invasion... Invasion of Zendikar that's uh, that's four mana brings in two basic lands. There's a bunch of cards like this that are four mana and they put two basic lands, so much so that now a lot of them have upsides in addition to the two lands. And some of them say, at least one of them says forests and not basics. And I'm wondering to what degree you'd, you'd be willing to play those. Because that goes from four to six, which hits a lot more of your cards. Though you have more five mana permanents, it does get you to the point that you could play two threes while still cutting out of three mana drops. I don't know. It's an idea I'd like you to think about, and I'll leave it to you to decide. But I think it could even out the curve just a little bit as well. Otherwise, I, I do really generally like the deck. I will have some additions without a lot of cuts, because I think at this point, uh, the best thing to talk about is for you to kind of, like you said, you're playing the games, find what is satisfying, what cards you find not casting, what cards you find, you know, don't do enough, and go from there. So take my additions with grains of salt, and at this point it's going to be testing that will note exactly what you should be doing. This is normal, by the way. I feel like I, I should be defending this. Uh, the idea is at a certain point, uh, a deck, when the deck becomes complete enough, all of the changes I'm going to suggest are just going to be side grades, you know, like alternative choices that may, not all of them, but some of them are just going to be alternative choices that depending on the meta might be really good, but might also be just kind of fall flat. So at a certain point, I have to leave it up to the deck builder to decide, but I'm going to name them anyways, because for certain people, it might be helpful. But first, let's talk about lands. It seems like today is a day of low lands, and 30 lands plus 5 MDFC, which is the uh, card that are lands on the back. So, let's think about this for a bit. We have a lot of ramp in our creatures, which I do like, and we have 3 visits and we do have Kodama's Reach, so we do have the means to get to a reasonable level of mana. But we can see that, like, oops. Where did it go? There we go. Starting at four mana uh, and five mana, it says we have a 42% chance to get all the 
uh, drops we need. I think we can still kind of improve this. I don't know. Personally, I don't think of MDFCs as necessarily... They're not literally lands, right? And I don't want to say that it's like two for one. Like, I don't want to say it's technically you're playing 33 and a half lands. And I don't want to factor... And I think... I think the, the, the idea is that you can factor... Um, what do you call it? Mana dorks as half a land and ramp as half a land. I, I don't quote me on this. I, I think I, I think someone told me this once, and I'm I'm gonna go with it for now just for the math. But we can say we've got five, six, seven, seven creatures at two mana, so I'll count them as three point five. One land, uh, one two two lands, so that's nine. So that's four point five plus two point five is. Seven, so 37-ish lands is the idea. I don't know. I wouldn't mind one or two. I don't know. I don't particularly... Like, of these lands, the two ones I'll count as full lands is Shatter Skull Smashing and Turn Timber uh, Symbosis. Turn Timber and Shatter Skull uh, the Hammer Pass are lands almost 100% of the time, and they will come in untapped, which I really like. Um... I don't know. It feels it feels wrong in my gut to, to say to just let this 30 land quote unquote 30 land deck go. So I'd like to say at least maybe think of one or two more lands. I'll leave it to you. I know some of my uh, some of my friends mentioned that like, you know, I think maybe right now I'm overvaluing valuing lands, but I I've played enough non games of magic and I've watched enough non games for magic. And you know, if you sit across from me with a deck like this that I've played a few times, I'm going to bolt every bird, right? I'm gonna I'm gonna destroy every single one of your elves because I know your deck can't sustain itself without the mana ramp. So I'm gonna interrupt the mana because interrupting the mana is a lot easier than interrupting, you know, old gnawbone. With that in mind, I wanted to suggest a few extra lands, whether whether like as additions or replacements. Uh, Firelit Thicket is a little more expensive than I like, but a filter land is fine in a deck like this. I think you're generally fine. I wouldn't play, you know, more than one of these kinds of lands, like the other one that uh, doesn't even tap for mana but filters into two. Uh, I wouldn't play that one. I think I would just play this one. It's not great that it won't let you tap for green the first turn, but it's not it's not terrible. Uh, game trail, I believe, was missing. Yes, uh, game trail, nice and easy. Apparently, it's been. Uh, <laughs> printed so much it is worth cents so that's ideal nice and easy uh dual land uh non-dual lands Yama, yavamaya these last uh, these last two yavamaya and boseju i just talked about them in my other uh video today they're just good green lands that you can play practically for free i'm not going to suggest the red channel land from the cycle because it doesn't work with your theme but boseju is just a good card that you're always happy to have uh, finally, uh, the Pathway. I like the Pathways. I think they're definitely worth playing. Uh, they're a little clunky in paper because when you play them, you have to unsleeve them. And you have to remember which one technically is the front side. I guess it does show on the symbol, but you know, if you don't pay attention or if you forget, it can be a little confusing. I don't think it's really relevant unless someone, you know, uh, flicker wisps your land, but it's something to think about. Uh, but I do generally like them. Uh, I know this person is vaulting across, but it really does look like they're doing a bit of a happy jump in front of the sun, and that's cute. Uh, I'd play this for sure. Then and then for fixing technically, uh, fetch lands are noticeably absent. You are you apparently are playing Taiga, but you're not playing any fetches, and that's interesting to me. I leave this to you. I don't know what your budget is, but if you can play the play the fetches, play the fetches. There are, you could play up to eight, I believe. No, yeah, I believe it's eight that have uh, in either colors, not including, I could be wrong, but I, I feel like it's eight. And I could cut out a lot of your forest and mountain and replace them, and they're just really, really good cards that you'd be happy with. And in terms of non-fixing, uh, non Skarg, Scar the Rage Pits, catches my eye because much like Keswick Wolf Run, it gives Trample at the same cost. Like Keswick Wolf Run, sometimes you don't pay for X, you just use it to gain, give Trample. 
And I do think that's really relevant in your deck. The ability to give your uh, giant creatures with haste trample is very, very important. And so I do recommend playing this. And considering the price, I think it's kind of free to play. All right, let's look through. I don't have that many suggestions. I have about eight, it seems, outside of the lands. So let's see what I've got here. First, uh, as mentioned before, uh, Relentless Assault. Uh, I just think it's a better call. I don't want to pay three for the enchantment and five to activate it. That's eight mana for this effect. Whereas this is the kind of effect that you sometimes just need to do once. So I don't think it's really relevant. It allows you to have more four drops, which you're kind of low on. And I think you'll be pretty happy with it. Sometimes getting the thing, like part of the thing with the enchantment is your opponents will always see it coming. And that's a bit of a problem here. Uh, whereas Relentless Assault is a surprise and you can immediately get the value from it. So I do particularly like that. Um, you're playing the Oliphant. Generous Ent is notably missing and I definitely think you can play this. It might also make me a little less land afraid <laughs> because you are playing the Oliphant. I wouldn't mind the like, with the Generous Ent. We're getting to a point that, you know, you will get your land drops this way if we count these as lands, but I will count them as 0.5 lands, and maybe I won't bug you so much on the land total. Uh, it does mean you're going to do a lot of shuffling, and you will still be vulnerable to certain types of hate, but um, I think it's generally fine. And the fact that Generous End, a 5-7, becomes a 10-12, that's not terrible, right? Even late game, you might still cycle it for a forest, but like at a certain point, casting it, getting a food token, attacking with it immediately is a pretty sweet deal. So I don't mind that at all. While looking for cards for this deck, I came across Bramble Familiar. Uh, the idea being that this is the new card. First of all, it's an elemental raccoon, which is adorable. Um, but the main idea is the fetch quest, right? And Fetch Quest allows us to mill seven and then reanimate, basically reanimate one of those creatures, most likely your really big creatures, into play. But until that point, your, your creature played early works as a mana dork, and then you can put it back in your hand so you can Fetch Quest again, or Fetch Quest the first time. This is really interesting, if not incredibly complicated. Um, there's a lot that can go wrong here, you know, like a lot. Uh, fetch quest isn't as good when your opponents know you have it because counterspell can be held up pretty easily for a seven mana sorcery and it's always worth it. The fact you have to go down a card to put it back in your hand is kind of frustrating, but acceptable. And the weird, weird wor uh, wording, like if that, if, ugh, I hate that they don't have the answer there. If I have rest in peace out, right? That will prevent the creature from coming back. It says milled cards. In my mind, milled means goes to the graveyard. If they are exiled instead, they haven't been milled, is once again what my brain says. I don't know for sure. I'm sure one of the commentators will know the answer to this. But I don't think if someone has rest in peace out, you'll be able to get the creature. I know they can't respond to it because it's one one like ability they will and one line of text as well you will get the entire effect all at once so you can't surgically extract not that anyone plays that in commander but you can't exile the card before it comes into play but it is worth noting that I at least think rest in peace effects will stop this kind of thing I don't know in the end this card feels a little clunky but also really really interesting and considering the way this deck is built I think this card is right up your alley right like you found a lot of ways to get a very low land count by supplementing it in other ways in a very tricky way to supplement your mana count and Bramble Familiar is kind of like that about you know cheating creatures into play so something worth considering um, I found this one because I was looking at four drops. Dragonborn Champion. <sighs> I don't know. I look at this card. Every time I look at this card, I just feel unimpressed by it. I'm going to be honest. I look at it and I'm kind of like this. It's like five or six dollars American. And <sighs> it doesn't it doesn't even have haste or anything. But then when I think of it in tune with your commander, 
Like one, its higher power is a lot more relevant because the power becomes the addition to toughness as well, therefore making it a 10-8, which is a really respectable stat line. The fact that it comes with trample, so you don't even need to worry about that. The fact that it's not when it deals five damage, but like a number of your big creatures will now draw you cards. It's it's doing something for me. I do really like it, and I think I think it's worth considering. I hope this isn't a card I told you to take out because I feel the hesitation in my voice and I'm wondering that if that's where it's coming from. But all in all, I do think this is a very cool card in a deck like this. And here I could definitely see it being strong. Um, these are something worth considering. Uh, Mass Hysteria and Concordant Crossroads. I think you're already playing probably a good amount of Haste Enablers. I... Our commander is a haste enabler. I think there's there, there could be enough in some ways, but I don't mind having some redundancy. Uh, mass, uh, mass Hysteria has just been reprinted, I believe. I believe both in... I thought at least Wilds of Eldraine, but I could be wrong about that. But I think in the secret layer drop for sure. Yeah, this is so cool. I love this art so much. Um, but I think... I think this is, uh, therefore, a little cheaper, and I think it's good, uh, whereas Concordant Crossroads oops, is technically the worst one, because if someone plays a world enchantment, it'll destroy this, but between you and I, I think the only world enchantment that's being played is this one, so I don't think that's a problem. It's up to you if you find these cards interesting. I think they're really good. I think they're really, really strong. I've said this a number of times, but these are the kind of cards that for that kind of incentivize your opponents to attack a lot, which is just really, really good when, you know, haste is already available to you, big creatures are available to you, and trample is more the problem. With when when people are attacking each other with all of their creatures because of the haste, you know your 15-15 creature without trample all of a sudden still gets through. So I do like them here. If you can get this art, I will respect your deck more. I love this text. I love this set. I heard maybe this is a this is a style that the artist does, uh, but I do I do really like it. If so, I need to check out more of their work. Um, another card, it's three mana, you'll have to forgive me, but it's Fierce Empath. And I don't know exactly how much I want to play this. Let's look at our six and seven drops. So six drops, definitely cards I would like to have. Seven drops, uh, old Gnawbone, I'm pretty happy with that. Here, there's nothing, and Galta. I guess if this always grabs Galta, you're probably pretty happy. But it does tutor a few cards in your deck. Maybe not enough. Maybe I would keep this on your mind if you find other six to, like, another card that you really like seeing. Like, if you do really enjoy playing Old Gnawbone, having a second copy can't hurt. It is a creature. It does have some benefits of being able to be flickered or reanimated and all that, but this deck doesn't really do those things. So, I leave this to you. I, I, I think it's an okay card, but it could fit in here if you wanted to. But a real, my last suggestion that I think is definitely worth considering is Helena and Elena. Hel Helena and Elena. They don't have rhyming names. I'm pretty sure about that. H Helena and Elena Partners. This is a legendary uh, pair of creatures that I am always impressed by. I am always, always impressed by when they come down and almost stupefied at their power. And in a lot of ways, this is kind of a... You know, this is a version of Zedagos, right? It gives haste and it grows your creatures. Now, this is different because it doesn't double those creatures' powers at first. But if you can make Helena, uh, Helena and Elena strong enough, it could do more than doubling, especially with smaller creatures. And then, of course, as, as we know, this upgrade is permanent. It is not temporary. Instead, it gives plus one, plus one counters that stay on the creature. I think this is really, really good. Not only is this one of those cards that acts as a replacement for your commander, it actually works really well in unison with your commanders because both of these are beginning of combat triggers. I should use this. Both of these are beginning of combat triggers. And then 
once you stack them, you do have to pick the target for these two, but then it'll check their power on resolution, not not at the... I, I think it technically checks twice, so in case that something happens to the creatures, it will use their last known uh, power. But if you can then target Helena and Elena, if you wanted to, for example, and double them, making them into four fives, you're going to be adding four plus one plus one counters. And then when you think about it, if you target, if you had targeted themselves with the ability, on that first attack, they're going to be eight nines. And when they reduce in power, they'll be six, six sevens. And from that point on, they'll give plus six counters on every combat. In addition, they work really, really well, obviously, with all your additional combat spells. They, I don't need to explain this. You understand this. They work just in the same ways that Xenagos works, and I think that's really, really good. To a good degree, depending on how you feel, they could also sub for each other. It's not. It would probably change the power level, and there would be some clunkiness to it, but they could take over if you were feeling spicy and you wanted to change commanders. You could swap each other out, put Xenagos in the 9-9, nine, nine, and then put Helena and Elena as your... Um, Helena and Elena as your commanders. And I think you would have a lot of... Um, a lot of success that way. And, yeah, I just recommend heavily that card. All right, those are my suggestions. A little bit of... Uh, to come to conclusion... Um, I like this deck. This deck is already in a really good space. Uh, I'm nervous about the lands, but I can be convinced otherwise. Especially if you bring in uh, the Forest Cycling Ent, I think you'll probably be in a fine enough position that I can look the other way. <laughs> uh, in addition, I've added a few, I've shown a few non basic lands that I think you could add to cover up the fact you have 15 basics. I would also, if you can budget for it, I would really recommend some fetch lands. This deck is trying to hit mid-high power, and at mid-high, you really benefit from those fetch lands, especially if you've got a tundra, uh, taiga, sorry. Uh, you'll be really happy with that result. There's a few three drops I don't particularly like, but the main thing I don't like is the fact that the three drops are the highest uh, column on your curve. And I honestly think a few cards such as Aggravated Assault and Kodama's Reach and Cultivate could probably be turned into four drops to kind of alleviate that unbalance. I also think, if nothing else, looking through the cards that I've... Generous Ent should be played, Brambo Familiar is interesting, Dragonborn Champion is fine, but I really think you should try Helena and Elena. I think you will really enjoy what they add to the deck and uh, provide both redundancy to the command zone, but also just be incredibly powerful with your commander. I hope this video was useful to you, and as always, if you'd like to submit another draft of this deck or any deck, there is a form you can fill out in the video description below. And if, like Eric, you would like your deck to be the next deck I take a look at, there will be a link for that in the, uh, in the video description as well. Also, if you could like, comment, subscribe, do the whole YouTube thing, I would be incredibly grateful. It is always helping the channel, and the channel is growing. Finally, thank you so much, Eric, for supporting the channel again. I really do like this deck. I really like the Theros Gods. I think they add a lot of interesting kind of, uh, what do you call it, like playability and kind of interaction as a non-creature commander at times. Uh, I also really like ephemera Ephem the uh, blue white one the god of the polis and also the karametra is another one that i really really like but i honestly i like them all and i think they're really fun commanders so if, if you watch this video and you want to make one of your own you know theros god commander send it my way when you're done because i'd love to take a look all right good luck with xenagos and uh i hope you smash a lot of face <laughs>